So I wanted to do a brief video on seedling vigor and selecting for seedling vigor in open pollinated corn. And so what one of the problems with uh, most open pollinated corns that you would find for sale, open pollinated field corns, is that they are very poorly selected for a, a whole bunch of traits. Typically, not always, but very often, they won't be well adapted to your photo period exactly or your latitude. They won't be well adapted to the disease conditions or your soil or growth conditions at the beginning of the year. And so one of the important things about growing your own open pollinated corn is you have to figure out and learn how to properly select it so that you uh, adapt the corn to your local conditions and the soil that you're going to grow it in and the growing system that you use. So one of the best ways to, to select for vigorous growth in seedlings is to significantly overplant your corn planting so that you can select from many individual seedlings for the most vigorous seedlings. And the time that you want to do that is right about now. These seedlings are at what you would call V3 or V2. Let me just pull this plant out. So if you look at this plant, here's the first seedling leaf, here's the second leaf, and here's the third leaf. And there you can see the leaf sheath on the third leaf and then the ligule and the leaf collar. And the fourth leaf is still rolled up and is still emerging. So this is what they call V3, okay? And this is a great moment to um, be selecting your corn because the corn has used up, if I can find it, let me dig up another plant. Okay, here we go. So the corn plant, if you, you can see, there's the kernel. And then here is the, the primary roots emerging at the base of the plant. So when the, when the um, shoot emerges, there's a, a seedling root, a radical, that emerges from uh, the kernel that goes down. And then the rest, the plant shoots up to the surface. And then when the plant emerges at the surface, it forms the primary root system at the surface, which is what this is right here, okay? And so if you look at this seedling, or at this seed, there's basically, the seedling has used up everything that was in. All the carbohydrate is gone. It's just an empty uh, shell, basically. So there's nothing, um, the plant is not reliant on the kernel anymore. So basically this is the perfect time to select for seedling vigor. Whereas if you are thinning a little earlier, you know, you might have a more vigorous looking seedling because it had a larger kernel and not necessarily because it had better genetics. So you wanna be definitely trying to wait until the kernels are done producing energy for the seedling before you start to select. But you don't wanna to wait too long because if you overplant like this, the seedlings will start to negatively impact each other in competition, especially under the conditions like we have here where I don't use a lot of additional fertility when I'm growing my open pollinated corn. So I need to thin these seedlings out. And now if you watch Dave Christensen's video about selecting for seedling vigor, he also plants very, very early with his painted mountain corn, and he's selecting for early, cold to um, early seedling emergence and cold tolerance in those plants. And that's something that I really want to get into, but I haven't quite gotten there with this uh, flint corn yet. But uh, in the long term, I'm going to start planting this uh, flint earlier and earlier. And the other, another thing Dave Christensen does is he selects, he thins multiple times. I unfortunately would love to do that, but I don't have time. So basically I select uh, just once. What I'll do is I'm just gonna go down the row here and uh, thin the rows to my desired plant spacing, and I'm not gonna do much thinning anymore unless I see a plant that I decide I really don't want in the population because I just don't have time to do multiple rounds of thinning. You know, my corn is sort of a side project and for uh, 
you know homestead use so i don't have time to like do multiple rounds of thinning although it's a good idea if you have the ability to do that because you keep uh choosing the strongest and strongest plants but in any case what we're doing here is we're just going through and i'm trying to space the plants anywhere from a foot to two feet apart you know and trying to get an average of like 16 to 18 inches apart and i'm just selecting the nicest plants the greenest most vigorous looking plants in each uh, row and trying to you know thin out all of the weaker looking seedlings and some of it is genetic and some of it isn't you know sometimes a, a seed just got in an unlucky position and you know it was planted too deep or it was planted on top of a rock or underneath of a rock you can see i have a lot of rocks but you know my seedlings have to deal with the rocks because there is no area on my farm that doesn't have a lot of these channers okay so i'm just going to go through really quick and show you what this little section of um row will look like after i'm done thinning Okay, so there's the plants I took out, and these are the plants that I've left. And I think you can see you're really removing a lot of plants, but what that does over time is it enables you to select for the most vigorous seedling growth. When I first started with this flint corn, I was always having a lot of trouble with uh, the seedlings being killed by red-winged blackbirds specifically. They would come in and yank out my seedlings and eat the kernels. And that, that doesn't happen anymore because I'm selecting for vigorous seedlings. And what happens, I think, now is these seedlings are throwing down a really, really deep uh, seedling root that holds that kernel tight into the ground. And so even if a bird grabs onto the, the shoot and tries to pull it, it will snap the shoot off before it will yank the kernel out. And so I didn't have any signs that red wing blackbirds or crows were pulling corn out this year. So um, that was very gratifying. So uh, I, and I feel like a lot of that is just proper selection for seedling vigor, okay? So here's a pile of thinnings, uh, so you can see you are removing a lot of plants and so that represents a lot of kernels. So in some senses you, you do waste a lot of seed, but the genetic improvement is what you're shooting for. So these guys are a little further along and these are the uh, transplants that uh, you saw me planting in an earlier video, um, the Geek Out video. This is Chapalote right here, and it's looking pretty good. 
um, on average. Um, I'm noticing there's a tendency for it to tiller, which is not that uncommon in some of these um, open pollinated uh, heirloom land race corns uh, from Mexico. So tillering is kind of a very basal trait. It's very teosinte like. So um, tillering is very common in many, many lines of corn. So let's see. So this is chapalote. This is all that very first seeding. And then here at the flag, it switches to the Tarahumara, which is a little bit taller. And I'm not seeing a little bit of chlorosis there. See that? Um, and here too. So this stuff is a little taller. It seems to be a little bit yellowed and chlorotic, but we'll see how it does. And then this is the Onaveño. And here, this stuff is also tillering a lot. You can see the tillers. Oh, you can see the tillers popping up here. This one has one, two so far. Um, but they can have as many as five. So that one's doing it too, see? So that may be, it's been induced by um, being transplanted because sometimes transplanting does impact the way the corn decides to grow. Um, it turns on different genes, but um, it may, it's very likely just um, a standard trait for um, some of these varieties. And that's just something I'd have to select against because tillering is not particularly useful in my opinion, unless you're um, making silage. Um, okay. So this row is a new thing that I'm trying this year and my very finest ear that I grew in 2016, the one that I just was the proudest of and the one that looked kind of the closest to where I wanted to go, at least in terms of uh, flintiness and uh, ear qualities other than, it wasn't orange enough, but it was a very fine ear and it used to be the ear that was on uh, my banner art on the YouTube channel, which I've recently changed. What I did was I made this row, basically what is called an ear to row um, row. So all of the kernels in this row are from that ear. So I'm just trying to see if this row can become a superior, if the, if the individual plants and ears on this row are you know characteristic of that year from last year or if that was just a fluke and so yeah it's something i want to check check out so but this row i have thinned already and i wanted to talk about the other thing that i like to do right at this time is this at this stage it's the perfect time to plant if you're going to interplant uh, a legume like common bean or cow peas for like a three sisters polyculture this is the ideal moment, um, right before the corn starts to stretch, and um, but it's already well established before you know, and so it won't be overwhelmed by the legume. And so I am going to be planting these black-eyed peas, these cow peas. This is Dolico di Veneto variety, which is a black-eyed pea, very fast, uh, semi-vining cowpea that I found works really really excellently as a as a interplanting polyculture with corn and uh, so yeah I'll just be planting one seed at the base of each plant or more than one in that case So yeah, I think I'll do a video later on in the season talking about three sisters and 
corn polycultures and my thoughts on that and why I think cowpeas are superior and stuff. But anyway, I hope this video was useful to folks and uh, thanks a lot for watching.